Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Vlasta Sikimic and I will host this session. It is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Helen Longino. And I can tell you something about organizing this event. So when I was asking myself who would be the ideal speakers on the topic of responsibility of science, my first associations, as you can see, uh, were female philosophers. And having in mind that philosophy was traditionally a male dominated discipline, I felt very happy, hoping that this might be changing. And who else can speak better about feminist philosophy of science than Professor Longino? Most of us read her work on feminist philosophy, scientific pluralism, and values in science. Uh, Helen Longino is a professor at Stanford University. She published three books, Science uh, as Social Knowledge, Values and Objectivity in Scientific Inquiry in 1990, The Fate of Knowledge in 2002, and a more recent book in 2013, Studying Human Behavior, How Scientists Investigate Aggression and Sexuality. Professor Longino is actively engaged within the scientific community as journal editor, and she has held many positions in various philosophical associations. Just for instance, she was the president of the PSA. And moreover, at the moment, she is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, Sciences. Today, Professor Longino will talk about the importance of the inclusion of marginalized groups in science, and we are very happy to have her here. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations to the uh, Weizsäcker Center for um, its opening. Um, I wish you uh, continued success. Um, and um, once we are all able to be in the same place um, that you have many lively uh, conferences and uh, interactions with yourselves and with the rest of the global community that is very interested in the sort of central topic for the center, namely responsible science. So this is wonderful and I feel very honored to have been invited to participate in your inaugural event. So thank you. Um, I want to, I'm going to share my, share my screen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say, I'm probably going to say things that most of you, any of you who've read my work will not be surprised by. I'm just trying to bring it into um, alignment with um, the themes of responsibility. Um, and then I look forward to discussing uh, these issues uh, with all of you uh, after the talk. Um, I think there's an interesting um, uh, congruence between what Nancy was saying earlier and what, what, what I'm saying, um, coming at it from slightly different uh, perspectives, different angles, and perhaps I'm more uh, continued to be interested in the uh, accreditation, how we get the things on the shelf, um, rather than uh, what we do uh, with them once once they're off, once once they're on the shelf, and we want to take them off. So there's a nice matching, I think, of our our uh, our, our different concerns. So I, with that as a beginning, I will start. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've. You can see from my title that I will continue to talk about this idea of critical contextual empiricism that um, I developed to talk about initially objectivity, but I really uh, intend it to be an idea that applies to scientific knowledge and then in my more philosophically ambitious moments um, to knowledge in general, but we don't have to talk about that today. Um, oh dear. Why is that not working? Oh, okay. Right. So um, there are uh, two conceptions, I think, of the sociality of scientific knowledge. One is a relatively shallow idea. So just going back a second, um, when Nancy was talking, one of the things she talked about was uh, with systems and the discussion it came up, the idea that that science is done by communities or by teams uh, and so forth. So science is social, but how is it social? And I think there are at least two different 
conceptions of that sociality. And one I think is um, uh, a, a relatively shallow uh, idea of uh, sociality and the other is a deeper or more constitutive um, idea. Um, the shallow idea holds that science is a knowledge seeking activity that takes place in a social world. Um, and for this idea of sociality, um, the question is how does the social context of scientific investigation affect the outcome of inquiry? Um, if we're working within the, the shallower form of sociality, um, uh, we will tend to give accounts of observation and measurement, uh, accounts of scientific reasoning um, that are abstracted from who it is that engages in observation or who engages in reasoning. And then we'll be interested in what happens to observation and measurement when they occur in a social context. Um, uh, the default view, um, of course, is that these observation and reasoning constitute cognitive activities of an individual. Um, and um, so observation is understood as the exercise of the perceptual capacities of uh, the individual while reasoning is understood as patterns of thought. Often we think of them because we're philosophers as modeled by classical categorical and propositional logic um, and uh, assessed with respect to their models of validity. Of course, we know that there are different logics and so forth and so on. Um, but um, uh, so deductive logic or uh, inductive logic. Um, so that's what we think of. So we think of individuals kind of in a, uh, in a social context um, and uh, doing these things, reasoning, observing. Um, so from the perspective of shallow sociality, we might wanna know how the efforts of individual cognitive agents are coordinated to result in knowledge of the phenomena the sciences address. Um, and in epistemology, we find that there's lots of discussion of testimony and disagreement, while in uh, science, we find discussions of the division of cognitive labor, the differential distribution of authority and appropriate deference uh, there too, um, and worries about non-epistemic motivations and biases. Now, um, one of the problems, and this is one of the things that occasioned those science wars in the 1980s, is that many sociologists observing how the sciences actually work because they went into laboratories and, and uh, uh, looked at how things happen, that when, when one situates observation and reasoning in their real context, that is where they, they're actually going on, those practices just don't look like the kinds of practices to which philosophers attribute justificatory import. Um, observation and reasoning don't take place, we might say, in a vacuum, and they don't exhibit the kind of purity of, of uh, content and focus that um, we tend to attribute them when we're, say, giving examples of, of reasoning and observation to students in a philosophy of science class, for example. As it happens, scientists select particular experiments, they select particular instruments, they select particular sets of specimens, they select particular measurement technologies, um, they interpret observations and experiments. They support or critique conjectures, conjectures or hypotheses. They derive consequences. They extend models to new domains um, uh, or uh, strategies to new domains. Nancy was just talking about uh, the exportation of randomized control trials from text in which they've uh, um, shown particular results to uh, contexts that may differ, uh, for example. So maybe scientists do that. Um, uh, they persuade others. And the point is, and this is what the sociologists kind of told us to our chagrin, um, is that there are multiple reasons for the particular choices and decisions that scientists make. Issues of feasibility, the potential for application, the aesthetic values that may be satisfied by a particular uh, model. Um, interest from other colleagues. If other people aren't interested, well, maybe I'm just not going to bother um, pursuing this question. I want people to, you know, engage with me. Um, interest from potential consumers. Intelligibility to colleagues. Um, resonance with metaphysical or ideological commitments. So these are all reasons that one might have to make the particular choices one makes. 
um, the various elements I was uh, just uh, just showing. So on the shallow model of sociality, those reasons really contaminate science and undermine its claims to knowledge. And that, um, that was why I think uh, there was such a reaction against what the sociologists were telling us about how science seems to work in the real world, uh, because they seem to be telling us that reason that actually um, uh, science as it works um, uh, is contaminated by these non-scientific uh, interests and motivations. Um, now, there is another way of thinking about the sociality of science. Um, and um, here, uh, sociality is not just a contingent fact about individuals who happen to find themselves among other individuals um, uh, on this uh, deeper or constitutive model. Um, the central elements of the knowledge productive practices of the science, observation and reasoning themselves, aren't taken to be paradigmatically practices of an individual, but rather are social. Um, secondly, success as applied to knowledge as content involves the social, and as a consequence, individual interests and motives for particular selections matter less than how the community, going back to a theme of the earlier talk, incorporates the contributions of its members. And I offered two kinds of arguments for this deeper uh, understanding of the sociality of science. One is looking at um, scientific cognitive practices themselves, just going back to observation and measurement. Uh, and the other is the logical problem of underdetermination. So if we think about um, observation, um, so in, in science, what we work with, or what scientists work with, I'm not a scientist, but it, it, researchers work with, uh, with data. Data are shared and trafficked in, in observation reports that are ordered and organized. The, the ordering uh, rests on a consensus about things like the centrality of certain categories, the speed of a chemical reaction as opposed to the color of its product, um, the boundaries of the concepts and classes that, uh, to which we assign uh, the data, just what counts as an acid, just what counts as water, what are gonna be the criteria for counting some substances, one or the other of these, um, and uh, a consensus uh, about the organizational and ontological commitments of a model or theory and so on. So, so our observation itself takes place using tools that are themselves the outcome of, kind of agreements to work in a particular way, agreements to pay attention to certain things rather than others, to mark boundaries in particular ways, and so forth. And that is, um, yeah, okay. I think I say this in a little bit. So, Observation, I want to say, is an organized sensory encounter that registers what's perceived in relation to categories, concepts, and classes that are socially constructed and maintained. Um, it's through our persisting to use them in the ways that we use them that they are maintained. And this ordering and organization are social processes. In particular, those communicative interactions in which a shared language develops. And it's, it's you know, we I think in our ordinary language, this has become very sedimented um, in the sciences, particularly with uh, researchers who are working on um, uh, with, with new and novel uh, materials, you can observe the interactions in which they make the decisions about what's going to count as, as, uh, uh, as, as what. Why, so why is it that observation has these characteristics? Well, you know, not just any observation is going to do. Observations have to be uh, stable. Um, uh, that is, that uh, an, an observation has to be framed in a way that when our sensory uh, equipment is focused on the same thing in the outer world, it'll register something roughly the same. 
as long as the context is uh, fixed as well. Um, they have to be stable. They have to be transferable. They have to be repeatable. They have to be transmissible. Um, they have to be intersubjectively accessible and intersubjectively invariant. So if I see something, if I register something as X, you look at the same thing and register it as Y, we have to figure out what's going on here um, in order, to, and then we want to get to a way of describing the phenomenon that uh, we can both uh, agree to in order that we have a description that can play a role in scientific discourse that can be taken out of the context in which you and I are working and uh, exported to another context. So those are social requirements and their satisfaction is ascertained through multiple forms of interaction. The status of the scientist's perceptual activity as observation depends on her relations with others, in particular, her openness to their challenge to and correction of her reports. And survival or modification of a report in response to this kind of challenge enables the transformation in assertability or status from, it seems to me, that P to P. Um, about reasoning, um, I also want to say that reasoning is in, in an important way social. Um, reasoning is a process that traces lines of evidentiary support between data and theories and hypotheses, um, uh, focusing on just justificatory reasoning. Justificatory reasoning establishes the plausibility or the likelihood of a hypothesis that's already been thought or articulated. So I distinguish it from um, exploratory reasoning. Justificatory reasoning, I take to be part of a practice of challenge and response. That is, it arises in the context where one is challenged uh, as to the adequacy or veracity of what one is claiming. And a challenge to a claim is met by the offering of reasons to believe it or accept it. Those reasons can then themselves be challenged on grounds both of truth and of relevance, provoking additional reasoning. So I want to say justificatory reasoning gets its point in a social context. There's really no point in engaging in justificatory reasoning except in this context of challenge and, um, and response. So that's one route to the underdetermination problem, just thinking about these, these uh, cognitive processes that we take to be kind of fundamental to uh, scientific uh, investigation. And the other, of course, is the underdetermination problem. Um, and, whoops, what happened here? I'm not sure how I can go back. Um, all right. Hmm. I seem only to be going forward in this, and I really want to go back. Uh, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna out of stop my share and and uh, find the slide I want to be on. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. No, play from, play from. Okay, that's where I was. So the underdetermination problem has been so the subject of lots and lots of philosophical ink. Um, I share it. Oh, and I share it. Oh, I didn't share it. Thank you. My that's apologies. Share. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. 
Thank you. My apologies. Um, hmm. Okay. So my version of the undetermination problem is the second one that it's about the relations between theories and the evidence that's available for them. Um, and here the point is that except in the case of empirical generalizations, there are no formal connections between theoretical hypotheses and the empirical data that are brought forward as evidence for them. Data instead acquire their status as evidence for some hypothesis or other in virtue of background assumptions that establish the relevance of the data to the plausibility or acceptability of the hypothesis. And this was, I think, really wonderfully expressed by Pierre Duhem uh, early in the 20th century. The idea is that data underdetermine hypothesis evaluation. And we can think of lots of examples. For example, um, in particle physics, um, our data used to be patterns of tracks in cloud chambers. Now they're sequences of ciphers on uh, data tapes produced by detectors on the basis of which we make claims about the behavior of elementary particles, muons, pions, and so on that are colliding and uh, disintegrating. Um, other example, uh, patterns of hemoglobin oxygenation and deoxygenation in brain tissue uh, are measured via magnetic resonance imaging. On the basis of those patterns, we make claims about the location of specific brain or mind activity. Um, this is very, um, uh, we make claims about the Earth's deep structure based on seismic measurements taken on the, uh, the near surface of the, um, of the Earth. So our data are about one domain, and we take those data to be evidence for claims that we make about um, other material that we do not otherwise have access to. Um, ascertaining the evidential relevance of data to a hypothesis and accepting one on the basis of evidence then is going to rel require reliance on substantive and methodological background assumptions. And those are going to be a function of consensus uh, in the scientific community. They tend to be learned as part of one's apprenticeship as a scientist and they're largely invisible as assumptions to practitioners within the community. They're just part of the lore that one acquires um, in learning to do uh, science. But even though they're invisible, they're, they can be articulated. They, they can be dug out of the, uh, the, the, the process and hence they are at least in principle public. And as public, they're available to critical examination as a consequence of which they can be abandoned, modified or reinforced. The presumption, I take it, in inference and in reasoning is that those assumptions on which we're relying all the time would survive scrutiny and criticism if um, they were subjected to it. So I wanna say the results of the activities of reasoning and observation are socially processed before incorporation into the body of ideas that are ratified for circulation and use or are treated as having been so processed before they go on the shelf. So to go on the shelf, to be put on the shelf is to have been socially processed through, um, I guess I'm getting to that, how? Okay, so this is something about background assumptions um, uh, and in the, uh, well, they basically, they constitute the intellectual context of inquiry. They circulate through and are enmeshed in the social context. Um, uh, they can be substantive, they, that is, they can be about the, the, kind of the compositional structure of the domain uh, in which we're investigating, uh, or they can be about the, uh, the kinds of processes we're interested, um, uh, looking for single causes, thinking that there are single causes for uh, any outcome, uh, looking for interactions and so forth. Um, and they can be methodological uh, from general epistemological views to views about the appropriate kinds of data for a particular um, investigation. And so the, the question of course is going to be um, how a community can be assured that the assumptions that play these roles are worthy of acceptance. How can a community be assured that the interactions that constitute its cognitive activity 
are not the result of coercion by a powerful authority, or even more likely of tradition that is accepted unthinkingly because that's how we were taught. Um, and then how can scientific knowledge be generated from cognitive activities that may rely on incompatible or incommensurable uh, assumptions? So the answer of course, is that they have to be subject to criticism at all places where they are operative, whether that's in data representation, observation, reasoning, and so forth. And that requires that we reconfigure justification as including not just observation and logical relations, as I think the, the shallow view uh, uh, would have it, but um, as requiring uh, and including interaction. And what kind of interaction? Well, critical discursive interaction in which we together examine the um, assumptions um, that uh, we are engaging with. And we examine them because we are challenged uh, about the assumptions that are structuring the, uh, the, the inferences, uh, the reasoning uh, that we are, are relying on. Um, as I've said mm, on too many occasions, um, that means that um, a full account of justification is going to have to spell out the conditions on, on what kinds of social interactions. Now, these are the ones that I have um, sort of come up with and been talking about. I'm certainly not committed to claiming that these are all and only the, the appropriate conditions on social interactions. Rather, my claim is that there have to be conditions on social interactions in order for those social interactions to perform the work that they need to perform. Um, so I propose that there have to be venues for critical inter interaction, that is places where um, critical action, critical interaction, discursive interaction is is uh, is, is 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 a part of the um, the the discourse. Um, and that's not trivial, of course. We know because of the up until very recently preference of journals for publishing uh, articles that um, uh, are about positive results rather than criticizing um, the work of uh, uh, that's been previously published. Um, there has to be uh, uptake that is, and by that I just mean that the, the pattern of beliefs um, uh, in the community um, has to be logically sensitive to the critical discourse that's taking place within it. Um, uh, the discourse has to be regulated by some standards. There have to be some, some standards. They have to be public and uh, generally uh, available. Um, and, and the community, I want to say, has to be characterized by tempered equality of intellectual authority. And those I proposed as the norms of critical contextual empiricism. Okay, I just said all that. Um, of course, assumptions that are shared by all members of a community are going to be shielded from criticism and because they persist in the face of effective structures, such as venues and uptake and so forth, they may even be reinforced. We can say, oh, look, we're open and so forth and so forth. But if we all share the same, the same assumptions, then those are not going to get unearthed uh, through this process, which means that diversity and dissent have to be regarded as resources for the community and not as problems or distractions. Um, and um, with respect to uptake and tempered equality, um, I think what we should say is that um, we can regard all perspectives at the outset as equally capable of generating criticism. And the uptake uh, requires that we have to, we have to respond and that the critic also has to be sensitive to the responses. Okay, so this uh, uptake requirement works uh, in all directions and a failure to adjust in the face of criticism or response means a failure of uptake and hence a loss of equal status. So that tempered equality of intellectual authority is something that um, is a kind of default condition that can be lost through um, uh, failure to respond in uh, uh, appropriate uh, appropriate ways and ways that are sensitive to 
the particular criticism that's being raised. So um, I want to propose that we get rid of some of the old terms. Um, instead of thinking in terms of justification, think in terms of epistemic acceptability. So something is epistemically, I'll give a criterion for that. And then I also think um, that uh, I have argued uh, this, that, that truth is too narrow a notion for the evaluation of um, the, the contents of science. Um, so I want to propose instead this uh, other uh, broader semantic idea of conformation. Um, and we can say that content is epistemically acceptable in some community at a time. If that content is, is or is supported by data that is evident to the community at the time, in light of reasoning and background assumptions, which have survived critical scrutiny from as many perspectives as are available to that community at the time. So not all perspectives, uh, possible perspectives are going to be available to us. If, if there are um, uh, other forms of intelligent life in the universe, we don't yet have any idea what, those, what their perspectives are. We have not had no, as far as I know, communication with them that would enable us to know what their criticism of our uh, assumptions might be. Um, so there's that. Um, and then the second uh, 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 condition is that C, the community satisfies the conditions for effective criticism. That is, it satisfies. And of course, this, this is a, uh, a kind of graded idea. Um, one can one can satisfy these conditions to greater or lesser extent, satisfy some better than than others, and so forth. Conformation I take to be an umbrella term for a family of se semantic success terms such as truth, isomorphism, homomorphism, similarity, approximation, and so forth. And um, I want to say represent representational content conforms to its intended object just in case it is true of the intended object, isomorphic or homomorphic with elements of the object, approximates or is similar to the object. Um, conformation too admits of degrees and respects, which are themselves a function of the aims the content is to serve. And what those aims are is socially established by the community. So this strikes me as a an example of a deeply social epistemology because it incorporates the social interactions of scientists into the normative scope of epistemology instead of excluding them as um, contaminating, for example. It's open to pluralist forms of realism. There's no guarantee of the uniqueness of um, uh, epistemic acceptability um, uh, of, of, of one uh, content as opposed to alternatives. Uh, and no guarantee of uniqueness of conformation. Um, and it tempers the role that social values may play in the development of knowledge through criticism that satisfies the critical contextual empiricist norms. Um, so when we understand observation and reasoning as social practices, their justificatory role becomes clearer. Um, and I think there are still lots of questions to be asked about the character of sociality, but. Um, for our purposes, um, does it really matter whether we adopt a deep or a shallow uh, sociality? Well, it, it isn't just uh, an academic question. So I'm going to just talk about a couple of examples that I think show, um, show this. Um, there's a piece by Heather Douglas that I like very much. She published it in 2000, um, and it's about um, research on the uh, toxic effects of exposure to dioxin, which is a byproduct of the production of paper. Um, and what Douglas's paper shows is that technical decisions that are internal to the research have social consequences. That is, in the course of the research, researchers have to make decisions about the level of statistical significance that they will, um, that they will adopt. They have to make choices about the dose response model that they will be using. They have to make decisions about how to um, classify borderline cases. Um, now, dioxin research, uh, dioxin exposure um, 
what about dioxin? So dioxin is released into rivers um, uh, and it has uh, toxic effects on wildlife. It has potentially effects on those who use the water from the river, that, the humans that use the water from the river. Um, and um, given, given that um, there are these uh, technical decisions um, deep in the uh, research. Oh, oh, what's the problem with the technical decisions? Well, um, if we uh, set a, a threshold of, of uh, statistical significance in one direction, we will um, underestimate the um, uh, effects of uh, dioxin on uh, living systems. If we set it in another direction, we will overestimate the effects of dioxin on living systems. Similarly, if we choose a, um, a linear res response model, we'll say that dioxin has effects all the way down. If we choose a threshold model, we'll say that there's a, a level below which uh, dioxin does not have um, uh, toxic effects. Um, and with borderline cases, um, you know, where there are little lesions on the slide, you can't, can't, they might be tumors, they might not be tumors. We'll have to set criteria for assigning them to the uh, malignancy or the non-malignancy uh, side in order to come up with a measurement of the results of exposure at a certain level. So these decisions have social consequences. They have, but they have two kinds of social consequences. They have consequences for public health. Either public health will be somewhat more at risk or it will be less at risk, but they also have economic consequences and they have economic consequences, not just for the, the, the owners of the factory, but also for the people who are employed um, and who make their livelihood working um, in the factory. So there are different communities with different stakes in the outcome of this research. How can these different communities trust the results of the research? And I hear, here I think, you know, shallow versus deep sociality offer different answers. On the shallow view, um, uh, we might say, well, um, uh, let's just make sure that there are no values uh, that are contaminating uh, this process. Douglas, uh, Douglas wants to say, that actually um, what, what this uh, case study shows is that scientists must bring their values to, uh, to the research. Um, I think the deep sociality uh, model offers us something different uh, to say here. The deep sociality model says, look, um, it's not the case that any individual scientist engaged in this research has to be guided by the right values. What are they? After all, there are different communities here. Rather, um, there, there, there is a community engaged in, in this research. And what we want is that all those who have a stake in the outcome of the research, all those who will be affected by the decisions that are made um, as a consequence of um, this research, the drinkers of the water, the workers in the factory, the owners of the factory, the shareholders, whoever, all of those people, um, um, have representation in the research community. That is, that their different perspectives be uh, incorporated and represented so that they can engage in that critical discursive interaction that um, uh, can point out where assumptions are being made that might be arbitrary or that need defense. Um, so that the outcome of the research then is the outcome of decisions on which all of the sides have, have come to some uh, agreement uh, about. So no, no individual is omniscient. No individual has the um, uh, monopoly on the right ethics 
uh, or the right morality, those come through our interaction um, with each other, through the interaction of multiple spec perspectives, all of which have uh, a stake in the uh, outcome of the research. Um, so another uh, area where we can see the importance of uh, thinking about um, scientific knowledge as generated through these social interactions is um, the success of feminist interventions uh, in the sciences in the last 40 or so years. Um, without those interventions, there is a lot of uh, work in physical anthropology, neuroendocrinology, cell biology um, that would have proceeded, proceeded sort of undisturbed in a particular uh, direction, which was, as it turns out, um, uh, supported by assumptions of uh, gender difference that assigned uh, certain characteristics to males and certain characteristics to females. Um, and that assignment of characteristics also happened to uh, seem to legitimate um, the um, different assignment of social roles and uh, the uh, differentials of power, the asymmetry of power that um, uh, has been a characteristic of, of, uh, of gender relations. Um, This goes to one of the questions uh, in a way that was being asked uh, earlier. So in the, there, there, the, the feminist interventions that took place in the 1960s and 70s were not the first. Um, if you go back and look at the history of psychology, there um, have been um, women engaging in criticism of the, the dominant uh, points of view. Uh, for uh, a long time. Um, the, the feminist interventions in the 60s and 70s were also supported by an external political movement, the feminist movement, uh, the movement for women's liberation. Um, and um, women came, there were complicated reasons why um, the sciences came to incorporate uh, more women um, in the United States. Some of those had to do with uh, a fear of declining person power in the sciences and that's so a need to open up uh, the sciences. But as they opened up the sciences to women, they also opened the sciences up to women who happen to be feminists and who asked certain questions about what um, these uh, dominant models were. Uh, say in physical anthropology, the model of man the hunter, for example, came under critique from um, people like um, uh, Nancy Tanner and other physical anthropologists who showed the arbitrariness of certain assumptions that were being made in the interpretation of the data that were used to uh, give a story of the evolution of uh, distinctively human, uh, human traits. Um, in neuroendocrinology, um, feminists sort of criticized the um, assumptions about the relations between uh, hormone secretions and, uh, and behavior. Um, there were uh, interventions in cell biology, and many feminists also started to think about the kind of values that were embedded in um, much traditional scientific research and to ask whether those were always um, going to be the most cognitively productive. So is simplicity always going to be a value in um, uh, evaluating models? So, so the influx of these outsiders into the scientific uh, community was able to raise questions about how data were selected, how data were being interpreted, what is counting as evidence, and how internal debates um, were, were being settled. These changes, which have in introduced permanent changes into uh, uh, this work, which is not to say that there aren't yet still efforts to um, ground uh, presumed uh, behavioral or cognitive differences in biological difference. That, that program has been going on since Aristotle and um, 
uh, continues always with a different sort of old wine and new bottles, I guess. Um, but these challenges, which have changed contemporary science, current science, um, uh, required the uh, uh, intervention of outsiders with a uh, different, different allegiance. And then um, I think another question that um, we ought to think about when we're um, thinking about how about about this this uh, kind of deeper social social model is think about what are the consequences of leaving the production of knowledge largely in private hands if it in the hands of um, pharmaceutical companies for for instance who um, can uh, treat the the knowledge that they produce as a a private uh, uh, a, a, a private commodity um, that is then not subject to examination by um, outside uh, outside critics. So, concluding um, the logical structure of science, I want to say is not sufficient to protect it from the influence of special interests, um, and the objectivity of science is maximized by the inclusion of an in critical interaction among multiple perspectives. And you know, we can we if we look, if we just look at how science works, we can see that that except in the case of privatization, or except in the case where certain communities are kept out of science, that this kind of interaction is just what takes place before um, some content or as um, uh, Nancy was saying, product. Is, is put on the shelf. Peer review is one example, but there's also uh, all the interaction that takes place around uh, preprints. There's all the interaction that takes place within the laboratory uh, among uh, laboratory partners. So it's, it's just full of interaction if we open our eyes uh, to see it. And um, it's that critical interaction that um, is what helps to um, uh, what enhances and helps to maximize the uh, objectivity of science or the success of science in achieving models that conform to their intended objects. Um, and if we think of science as directed in some way towards promoting the common good, then um, it can best do that when it includes representatives of all those who are going to be affected by the outcomes of the research. So, on this view, um, responsible decision making in science requires multiple participants uh, reflecting different points of view, critical interaction among whom can draw attention to the values or other unexamined presuppositions that are embedded in the background assumptions that provide scaffolding for data selection and interpretation, and can tease out the potential implications of a model for the different stakeholders. Thanks.